switch into English because I'm extremely excited about our next guest. Someone who knows better than anyone what livable cities must look like in order to be cities for people. Someone without whom Copenhagen would not be the, one, the most, world's most livable city. And someone whose expertise is in demand all over the globe. The architect and urban planner, Jan Gehl. <laughs> Thank you. Please, the stage is yours. I have some bad news for you and some good news. I'll be speaking in English. But the English I can speak will be very slowly, slow, and I only know 300 words. So the English I can speak you can understand, I hope. I have been allotted 25 minutes and I have to go fast. Okay, livable cities for the 21st century. With all this mobility talk around here, I all the time think it's important whenever we work on cities that we don't forget the first principle. P do the first things first, and then you can look into the mobility, and we'll come into that. Now we are eagerly waiting for some wonderful technological developments they will solve all the problems we ever had in cities. We are having autonomous cars. They will solve all the problems right away. Just look here. There are no problems left, except it looks very, very shabby. Then if we have more problems, we have drones and helicopters. We can fill the sky with all these, and we will have a much better world. Look closely here and see if you would like to spend your old days just there under this umbrella of helicopters. Then, of course, we can make smart city, and that's very smart. But I think with all these gimmicks, they are very expensive. So it will take a long time to roll them out, and especially long time to roll them out where they really are problems. That is, in the third world countries, in Ukraine, there'll be a long time before they can afford all these fantastic gimmicks. But there are some first principles. While we are waiting for all these fantastic, wonderful things, which will solve the problems, we can ask if there are meaningful things we can do. And I think there's something we can do, all of us, right away. Make people your first priority. Always make sure it's a nice city, because before you begin to make it a mobile city. A short look at history. This is about city planning in the 20th century, or the short story about how for 50 years we've done everything to chase people away from the cities. We have had these two major paradigms. Modernism, where instead of making spaces for people, as in the old days, we started to make, make objects. Say a city is a number of objects, and whatever is not built upon is leftover space. People hate leftover space. And the other big thing which has happened has been the car invasion. And I think it got really bad around 1960, 15 years after the war when we started to get the wheels rolling again. So we had the car invasion coming various times, various times in various parts of Europe and the world but it's very universal by now. And that has been quite a revolution. I have here a picture from Copenhagen. Uh, <clears throat> in 1905, it was a peaceful city. It was a people city. People were strolling all over. They be, this public sp the spaces belonged to the people, and there were one car, no problem. But already 20 years later, we had postcards like this in all the Danish cities. Here, the arrival of the motor cars. Save yourself if you can, save your children. Everything is squeezed out. And then 50 years later from Copenhagen, all the squares were full of parked cars and all the streets were full of everything. Completely chaos. 
And in this situation, all the cities I know, they, may, they hurried to make a traffic department and they started to count all the cars every year to make, have data about the car invasion. And from that time on, there was a worldwide focus on making the cars happy and forgetting about the people who always owned the city. In my office one day, we sat down and said, let's talk about all the gimmicks the traffic engineers invented to make it nicer to be a car. And we found that all of them made it less nice to be a person. For the first thing, with the cars came the 60 kilometer an hour scale. In the old days, we had five kilometer an hour scale. Completely different story. The 60 wide spaces, big signs, no details, you can't see them. And the other one, you can see people. And then, of course, the one-way street, a wonderful idea because it gives you more capacity and higher speeds. But it's much more complicated and dangerous to cross such a street. So why not have leisurely two-way traffic as we always had? Then we invented green waves for cars. But we have seen now later that you can also make green waves for pedestrians and for bicycles. It's just not done so quickly. Then, of course, there was not room enough, so we can always take room from the people and have narrow sidewalks. People need space to walk and to feel free and whatever. Then we have a speciality, which is sidewalk interruptions. In London, every time there is a garage, you cut the sidewalk so that the wheelchairs go up and down. Every time there is a little street, anything, you cut the sidewalk. On Regent Street, there are 24 unnecessary interruptions of the sidewalk. Of course, the sidewalk should be continuous so that the wheelchairs can roll through the city and everybody can. So instead of interrupting the sidewalks, then take, make continuous sidewalk, continuous bike lanes, and let the people in the Mercedes-Benz wait for a moment until the other guys have moved away. Then there is a speciality, sidewalk obstacles. Whenever you have a thing in, in the city, you put it on the sidewalk so it's not in the way. In the way for whom? In the way for the pedestrians. And you have all kinds of things. In many cases, it gets really interesting to be a blind in these sidewalks, which is full of obstacles. For God's sake, we need space. We need decent respect for walking. Then, of course, all this about parking on the sidewalks, I'll not talk about it, but show respect for the people. Then you can see in many countries, they have a lot of guardrails because they think that pedestrians are cheap sheep which shall be behind the fence. And then if the fence is in the way, they just climb through it anyway. Do as in Copenhagen, make a good a good uh, median in the middle so you can go one lane and look the other way and go the next way so you can cross anywhere instead of all these guardrails. Then there's a good view. Um, of course, when you come to a corner, take the pedestrians halfway down to the next corner and take them across and then let them go back. No, of course, they should be able to walk straight and then there's an awful thing which you find in every place where British road engineers have been at work. That is that you have to apply to get across the street. They have not invented computers over there. So they rely on people telling the machine that I need to get across. I've, we've studied it. It's in Australia, it's in New Zealand, it's in India. Everywhere where the British have been, have this awful idea. I thought it was a human right to cross a street and that you can organize it, but it's just to hum humiliate people that you have to apply to get across. And I heard that 50% of all these push buttons are connected to nothing, so it's just that you get the feeling. 
of, 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 being, of being underdog. Of course, what you should do is gently tell the pedestrians how many seconds they shall wait. Then there is this other thing that the blinking man, you find it in New York and many other places, you get out in a green light and then he starts to blink and then he blinks more and more and the old lady gets more and more terrified. Of course, what you should do is again to tell gently how many seconds you have to do your crossing. Then, of course, you can make the crossings as obstacle courses. They are expert in Britain to do that. You apply and go to an island, then you apply again, go to another island, then you apply for the third time, and then you cannot get further before it gets green. That's not the way to treat people. And then there are long waiting times of course, you can organize it so that you share the waking times. And then, of course, many places, they have these pedestrian tunnels. Get rid of them, get them underground. In the Soviet times, all the cities in the Soviet empire, they put the people in tunnels. You can see them still all over the place. But no people would like to go downstairs and just for the sake of it and go up again. This is Zurich, where they had a tunnel, but now they have a pedestrian crosses, and that's much, much better. Then, of course, the pedestrian bridges, let's not talk about them. The people who really need safety, they're the ones who cannot re need uh, use the bridges, but you can easily make, in Copenhagen, we, we have uh, pedestrian crossings with 50,000 pedestrians a day and 50,000 cars the other way. No problem. Then you have this idea of jumping from one ice floe to the other. That's very widespread and it gives you very beautiful street crossings. Of course, let them cross in dignity. Of course, when you have cars to moving fast, you need a round corner so you don't have to slow down. But the pedestrians would like straight corners where they can go straight. It's two different lines. And then there's this thing called a slip lane, where suddenly all the rules doesn't apply. And you tell the kids that every time there is red, you should stop. But the cars shall not stop with a slip lane. If only there was. A... Then, there of course, is that in some countries you can turn on red. And that's very difficult to tell the children that sometimes some people can turn on red, but you cannot. All this, we found, has been gradually introduced, and we've got used to them so much that many times we cannot really see it. But it's so many ways in which it's become more dangerous and more difficult to be a person. What was known about this time, 1960, about quality for people, we knew actually virtually nothing. But then, of course, we started to hear some objections to all this from New York, from Jane Jacobs. And my life has also been about raising the voice to point that the major thing to look after in cities are people, not cars or not concrete blocks, whatever. This is my professor. He was the one who said, a good housing area is something which looks good from the freeway. So that's better quality for people. Here you can see how, it, how wonderful it is in Sweden, in this particular area. I had to go, uh, yeah. I, I married a psychologist at that point, and then I had all these discussions at home. Why are you architects not interested in people? Why don't they teach you anything about people in School of Architecture? And we said that, that it doesn't matter what you build because people will adapt. Blah, they said, you know this much about. I had to go back to School of Architecture for 40 more years to hear wh what they did not tell me first time. Then I found out they didn't tell me anything because we knew nothing. So we had to find out all these things from the beginning. So I sat there for 40 years uh, watching how people use cities, how people use architecture, how the patterns, how the human senses worked and all that. 
And then I, I started to write a book, actually way back, 50 years anniversary, Leben zwischen Häusern. Um, it's still coming out, actually. It's come out 30 times, but 15 times inside the last 10 years. It's, it's still coming out. It just came out in Iceland. I'm very proud. But I'm more proud that this book and other books of mine are out in developing countries because I think that's very important not to forget about the people in the rush for development. It's e then I wrote another book 40 years later and <coughs> there was this foundation who came to me and said, would you write down everything you know after 40 years of research while you can still remember it? Then I had to write State of Your Mention, which is in 10 years out in 40 languages, which I'm very proud of and happy about. In all this research, we of course found out that there's been so many developments, so many gimmicks, so much techno technological development, whatever, that we almost forgot about the client was the same as it's been all the time. It's a slow, linear, horizontal, five kilometer an hour walking creature. And it has a very great interest in other people. It's a social animal, it's a walking animal. That's the same, we have the same height, we have the same senses as they had 100 years ago on the square in Copenhagen. Um, and these people will have to fit into all these mobility considerations. In this, we, there has been a number of important changes and new challenges. And every mayor I know of in the world will like or demand, I want a livable city, I must have a sustainable, a healthy city and a good city to be old in. This about the livable has to do with, the, with the, all the very, very old and important need for public space and public places where you can meet your fellow citizen and watch the girls and do all the things you always did and which is very important, it, you cannot live out of, out of a cell phone. You have to see people with your own eyes and be able to interact now as ever. If you doubt if we need lively settings, then look at the perspective drawings the architects do. They are crawling with happy people doing things they would never do. And that's a sign it's a good area. A good area has life and people are happy and they don't go home, they stay there, and they are very happy. We know that. Then, of course, another important thing, we have to make the cities much more sustainable. And just to speak very slowly, the more we walk, the more we bicycle, the more we use public transportation, the better for the climate. And, of course, this lady can now drive her kids to climate demo because she has a new electric shared car. This is not really what I understand with sustainability. We have a very serious situation. In Copenhagen, they have started to put out benches which are ready for the water to rise one meter in the next 60 years. So we are ready for that, just to think about it. We also have a new challenge now that my daughter is a doctor and she constantly tells me, we have this sitting syndrome. People sit too much and walk too little and we shall make city planning so that people use their own energy at least one hour of moderate exercise for everyone every day. And we know that walking and bicycling is the obvious thing to build into the city planning to make sure that we move, we actually live seven years longer, have a much better life in the old days, and we are much cheaper for society if we move, so make sure people move. Then we have, this is new, we never had this before, but now we have a very big population of elderly people who have retired, but are generally fine, and they have to have a good life where they are. And we have to make cities so that it's wonderful to be old, 
that you don't have to go to Florida, all of you. A good city to be old in, you should be able to walk in the park, but you get very bored of walking in the park after a while. But you should also be able to walk where your friends are, where the society, where the neighbors are. So it's a mixture of places. And I know that the doctors say 10,000 steps a day keep the doctor away. And just by going from the hotel over to this mobility, I had 8,000 steps. So I was very close. But it is a very lousy place to walk, I can tell you. <laughs> <coughs> But we will have to make the city so that the old guys can have a fantastic life and move quite a bit every day with great joy. So want it all this, if we look carefully after people in city planning, then we will have all these things addressed. So a simple recipe for a fine people city, and that's something which we prepared when we worked in London, where I was really shocked about how they treated the pedestrians in London and later on, of course, in all of Britain. Um, we said, what, we went out to look for the justice. You should be able to get along. You should be able to cross the streets. You should be able to get around. You, there should be places to sit if you were tired or if you wanted to enjoy. You should be able to hear and talk. There should be a nice climate at eye level where you are. It should be a nice city aesthetically to look at. And it should be a good city by night. Very simple. But take this list and go to any place and see how much of this you can say yes to. I could tell you a lot about these various cities, but I will not. I will absolutely not. Um, but I will invite you to Copenhagen because they are the city which for 60 years now has had increasingly a people-first policy in the city planning. They started in 1962 to take the cars out of the main street. Great, great uh, tumult and criticism and whatever. We will never be Italians because we are Danes. Then they took the cars out and we started right away to be Italians because we had no place to be Italians before the cars came away. It was a big success, so they've done, every year they've done more and more and more. And in the 60 years from 62 to 22, they have done really remarkable things in the city center, which is very good. <clears throat> There's one thing which is special for Copenhagen, and I can recommend that. We say a saying, saying what you count, you care for. And I mentioned that all the traffic engineers have counted the cars for 60 years, but, but how many cities do you know who have a department for pedestrians and public life? And how many cities have records of the life in the city? But what was special about Copenhagen was that was the first city in the world who got data and records about the city, the life in the city, so we knew as much about people in the city as about the traffic in the city. And then suddenly the politicians could choose, would you make it nicer for people or make it nicer for cars? So this was a revolution, and many cities have taken this up to make sure they have data and knowledge about how people use the city, how it could be better. Copenhagen have, of course, uh, strategies. And this one from the city council, 2009, we will be the best city in the world for people. And then they start to go, say, five years from now, we shall be here, then we shall be here. Uh, <coughs> two examples of how they do it. That is an old Copenhagen street that was just asphalt from wall to wall. The new street, the same street actually, is now only two lanes. They have a good median in the middle so you can cross. They have street trees, they have bicycle lanes, they have sidewalks. The lower street is much more beautiful. It's much safer for all categories of traffic 
and walking, and you can take the same number of cars as the old street could, because the traffic engineers are smarter nowadays. And the, all this about continuous sidewalks, that's a very important program in Copenhagen and many other places, that the <coughs> United Nations uh, human rights rules doesn't say that a mercy dispense coming to a corner shall be able directly to go in all directions. That's something the traffic engineers have invented. So you can invent the other way that the pedestrians go and the bicycles go. But most important, my granddaughter, Laura, who is seven, she can walk from her door to the school without crossing any streets anymore. My daughters say that's a fantastic improvement on quality of life. We could talk a lot about the bicycles you have talked, but in Copenhagen, they've done a lot for bicycling um, as a complete bicycle network. And of course, we all time use the principle that the park cars shall protect the bicycles instead of in many places, they let the bicycles protect the park cars. That's a completely different cup of tea. This is from Melbourne, and they call it Copenhagen style bicycle lanes. The critical part in a bicycle season are the crossings. The crossings in Copenhagen have been studied, and of course, the more bicycling you have, the safer it is. But now, my grandchildren of 12, they can go all over the city on bike from their 12, which is a fantastic quality. <coughs> so what we've seen by making a very good and safe bicycle infrastructure citywide, we've seen the, the We've seen the bicycling race and race and race, and now about half of everybody commuting to work and studies in Copenhagen, they come on their bike. 10 years ago, it was 38%. So we learned from Copenhagen that if you make good invitations for walking, public life, and bicycling, you will have more of exactly that. And what happens when you do all these awful things to the traffic in a city. The Minister of Culture starts to read really good books and makes a new traffic architecture policy where they put people first. What happens when you do all these awful things to traffic in a city? My best assistant through all the years, she is now city architect. What happens when you do all these awful things to a city? By God, they put my face on the bus stops and the metro doors and say that the, this kind of philosophy has been instrumental in making Copenhagen a good city. What happens if you do all these bad things? You'll find Copenhagen again and again on top of the list of livable, most livable cities in the world. And if you look at the other ones, most of them have done very nicely for people and for people for pedestrians, for public life, and for bicycles. So, by putting people first in the city planning, you should realize it's the simplest and cheapest you can do. It creates a better city for all in the city. The young ones and the old ones and the handicapped, everybody have a better life. And you can do it in cities in all parts of the world because it's not heavy in investments, it's, it's peanuts. And you can start tomorrow in any city, anywhere in the world. Ta-da. <laughs> You're looking at me. Thank you very much. And now we open. That, that, that was my speed record. <laughs> really? My quickest lecture until now was one On hour, point. 22 minutes. <laughs> Great. But now we have the time and we open up for you. And you have the great opportunity now to ask, to comment on whatever you like. So here's your great chance to talk to young girl, whatever is in your mind. Let's, let's do it and let's start. So let's see. Let's see what the Germans do. They, they're scared. No. Then we have someone and we have a mic, of course. 
Yeah, I have uh, one question. In, in the end, you said um, a pretty wise uh, sentence that you can start today and um, it's quite cheap to do so. And maybe that's the reason why in a lot of Western European cities, people don't start uh, doing this because you can't earn money with uh, bicycles and with walking. And um, if the investments for the infrastructure go down, there's business models going away. And maybe that's the reason why we do not start. When I look around here, I, I think that there's a lot of, of investment opportunities here. And the weakness of people walking and bicycling is that there's no money there. And, uh, but it's good for economy. It's good for... Uh, I know that in Copenhagen they found that if a guy do a kilometer on a bicycle, the society earns 25 cents uh, when they count everything. And if the same guy go a kilometer in his car, the society loses 17 cents euro when you count everything, including hospitals and lawyers and insurance and whatever. So um, there's good economy, but it is not uh, instant economy. There is, it's not something to invest in. And that really has been the problem. I've been wondering all the time, or, or, or sort of criticizing, that everybody has been so focused on mobility that we almost forgot that the major thing in cities were not the mobility, but whether we had a good life in the city, whether there were places worth living in and worth going to. And I think this, this frenzy about mobility is like if you make apartments, like make uh, um, accommodations where you use all your energy on the corridors and forgot the living room and the, the, the studio and the kitchen and the bathroom and the, the place where you live and concentrate it on the corridors. It's so important in city planning that we do a lot for the neighborhoods and the places we go to and not only of how to get from there to there, but there's more money in this than in this. <laughs> The question is answered. Another one. No one? No one? Okay. Well, you had these nice examples uh, of um, pedestrians crossing uh, streets and so on. Maybe uh, you should walk to uh, Cologne in Nippes, Neusserstrasse. There is a, uh, a crossing where all the four directions for pedestrians uh, get green. So you can not only walk from one side to another, you can also walk diagonally. Uh, so this is, uh, I don't know, I know whether you've seen something like this. This is very interesting. Yeah, I know that. It's called a barn dance. A barn dance, where all of them stream out from the same time. It's, it's wonderful, but it means that all of them have to wait a longer time because they have to wait two cycles instead of one. And, and uh, then it is wonderful for a little while, but you wait twice as much generally. So there are limitations and there are advantages. Barn dance. But I would also say, I mentioned all these examples, over the years in many cities they have gone out and corrected this and corrected that and <clears throat> um, <clears throat> I'm not supposed to tell about it but I have also worked for Moscow when they were nice 10 years ago and they have all these tunnels and then of course we don't do tunnels anymore but everywhere in the old Soviet they have tunnels so also in Riga, we suggested to put sand in the tunnel and let the people go across and let the cars wait a little moment until they go on. Um, so many places they have started, and we don't do tunnels anymore. We don't do overpasses anymore, unless it's a railway or something. Uh, so we have become, in various countries, in various degrees, but not in England, 
we have become more clever and do more things carefully, more carefully now. Barn dance. <clears throat> yeah, Jan, thanks. First of all, thanks you very much for your wonderful uh, speech, and it's an inspiration every time to listen to you. Um, we have a funny problem sometimes here in Cologne, um, but I think maybe you, you know that from somewhere else. If you, our open public space is more or less only parking and traffic space, and there's no, no, almost no space for, for living, for meeting, for, for playing. And if you want to change that in, in some areas, and some people they get so used to this situation that there's the, a public space, it's not a public space, it's a traffic and parking space, that they say, no, no, we don't want it. There might be that people meet will, they will meet here. And maybe there will be some noise. Maybe the pe people will meet, meet in the evening. And so we get really sometimes strong discussions where people are afraid of better quality. And sometimes when, and especially these are the people that are getting very loud and they're getting support from the media and so on. And so it's a tough ch uh, challenge to make this work. Yeah, there are, there are many... Um... <coughs> I would actually say that um, what I would suggest is that do as we have done in Copenhagen and they are doing it now in many other places, try to make a survey of the life as it is, compare it with other cities and my experience with the people you talk about, if, if you show that you could have it this way or that way or just as you are used to, what would you prefer if you show them what the opportunities are and what the other cities have done? My experience is that people will very quickly say, yeah, we would like something like that. Uh, but you need the data. We worked in New York, in Times Square, and no time for see, talk about that. But the mayor of New York, he was very great. He said, Michael Bloomberg, he is, was, in God we trust, but now bring me the data. And then we have to go, and we found out that on this cramped sidewalks in, in Times Square, 90% of all the people were crushed there, and 10% of the people had 90% of the space to move around in cars. And he said, well, turn it around. And then we were able to close Broadway in Times Square and other places. Bring me the data that helps a lot and show examples from other good places. It's not meant to be as it has grown into. Data. Data. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Jan. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> So we're going this down, way. Yeah. yeah.